It's my pleasure this evening to call to order this meeting of the Waco Independent School District Board of Trustees. And we have confirmed a quorum of board members is present. This meeting is available as a video and audio conference in accordance with the governor's suspension of certain open meeting requirements to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. In accordance with those suspended rules, we certify the following. Members of the public may view this meeting online at http colon forward slash forward slash wacoisd.org forward slash CAC meeting. Members of the public were instructed to submit their comments in writing to Joshua Butcher via email by nine this morning. All items to be discussed or voted on upon have been posted in accordance with state law. Finally, if you have any questions about the suspended open meeting requirements, please contact the Office of the Attorney General by calling 888-672-6787 or by emailing toma at aoag.texas.gov. So at this juncture, we are moving to the public comment section of the agenda. It's my understanding uh, that there were no public comments submitted, so we can move on. Let me say, as we move on, that um, this is our sixth meeting. And I, as always, we can express our appreciation to those that are involved on our community advisory committee. Thank you so much for your participation. The information exchange, the data we're gathering is very, very important as we move through this process, not only for the betterment of the community, but certainly uh, to improve our schools, to improve our facilities and uh, make our educational experience for our students uh, uh, to the next level. So thank you so much for your attendance. We know it's a big time commitment. Uh, this is a six meeting of eight, I believe. So we're three quarters of the way through the process after the night. And again, thank you for your time commitment and sharing your ideas and thoughts with us. With that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kincannon. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, it's hard to believe we're already to meeting six. It has been going by quickly, I think. Um, appreciate you being here this evening. Uh, we're going to, we have a lot of ground to cover tonight. So I'll, I'll I'm going to start with a request um, this evening that we take it real slow this evening. And I'm going to ask you, because of the number of elementary schools that we have and the amount of information that we're covering, I'm going to ask that you write your questions down um, on a piece of paper to ask later in the session and to um, refrain initially during what I call the direct teach part of our lesson, refrain from interrupting um, our architects as they explain the options. And then when we get um, a little further along, then we'll allow opportunities for questions and discussion and we'll have some breakout rooms again this evening. Um, but I would like us to stay really focused on the content and really absorbing that content before we um, start discussing pieces of it. So with that, um, if everybody can do that for us this evening, we appreciate it. And I will pass it to um, our architect, O'Connell so Robertson. We should have Jared Sterzinger with us. Yes, ma'am. I am here. Thank you for having us again tonight. And we're excited to be here. Uh, I'll kind of run through the first couple slides of it. We've been a great participant so far. We'll keep that going. Everybody mentioned we're here April 12th on our sixth meeting. Uh, and you'll see here meeting seven and meeting eight, we've started lining up some additional content uh, as we're rounding this out, uh, including a demographer up, update uh, and starting to hit on a summary of project. Uh, and then the following meeting would hit bond capacity, which is our financial planner uh, talking about uh, how certain dollar amounts affect the district and working through a prioritization of projects. So nearing the end of the facility master plan process, uh, but as everybody noted, we have a lot of content to cover uh, this evening, focusing in on some follow up from last time, but jump into the elementary school options, which does a include a lot of information. 
So uh, welcome everybody. And uh, again, thank you for participating. We're gonna jump right into our CAC meeting five follow-up. Uh, and out of that follow-up, and uh, I'm gonna be passing it over to Kyle here. There were a few questions that were asked last time. So we wanted to make sure to get those addressed here in front of the community. Kyle, you wanna take it from here or you want me to address these? No, I'm happy to take it from here for a second, Jared. And thank you for um, opening the meeting this evening. Uh, we wanted to hit on some of the questions that have uh, quick answers and we'll dig deeper into those demographics questions that might be a little more complicated when we have the demographer with us. Um, but one of the questions that we had coming out of the last meeting from the committee was about the makeup of Lake Air Montessori School. And you can see we have about 750 students there and 160 or so of those students are in the middle school grades six through eight. Similarly, there were questions about the facilities condition assessment and what share of those costs across the district were specifically for maintaining Lake Air Montessori Magnet School in the, at the level that the facility is at today. So those infrastructure costs not necessarily doing anything to address the learning environment or modernize the environment overall. And that's pegged at about $32 million over the next 15 years. Um, and then folks who wanna dig more deeply into those facility conditions assessments in each of our presentations about high schools, about middle schools, and tonight about elementary schools, you can see a summary with the range of those costs for each campus. You can go back and find those presentations on our website, including recordings of the meetings. Um, and if you go back to that second meeting, you can find a much deeper conversation about what the facilities condition assessment looked at and what those ranges represent. We also had some questions about Tennyson Middle School and the Atlas program and how those relate to each other. And so we wanted to share a few numbers about Atlas Academy with you tonight. Um, specifically, someone had asked about the Atlas enrollment and how the number of students in the program related to the middle school attendance zones that those students lived in. Um, you can see that breakdown here with 52 students would normally be zoned to Cesar Chavez, but are attending Atlas, 37 to Carver, 54 to Indian Spring. 88, the, the largest group of students are zoned to Tennyson itself. And then we have six out of district students in that total of 237. The map that's behind those numbers shows you where all of our middle school students live in this section of the district that you're looking at. The shaded area for blue is the Tennyson attendance zone and the blue dots are students that attend Tennyson. Um, what I would point out is in that sort of pinkish salmon area, you'll see a large cluster of blue dots in what is the Crestview Elementary Attendance Zone. Those are students who are currently zoned in in spring, but those blue dots, there are students that attend Tennyson. In effect, even though Crestview is currently part of the Indian Spring Middle School attendance boundary in practice, most students, nearly all students from Crestview are ultimately going on to Tennyson. And that reflects a boundary that until a few years ago was split and then some changes were made between Indian Spring and Tennyson and some changes were made to bring it all into the tennis or into the Indian Spring zone. Um, but you can see in practice, we still have a lot of students from that Crestview zone going over. If we can roll forward to take a look at a similar map focused on Indian Spring instead of on Tennyson, um, you'll see again where those students attending Indian Spring are. Those students are, are the young and are pink color. The specific questions we got talking about Indian Spring and Carver and the possibility of pulling those two attendance zones together in one new facility located at Carver was how that would affect transportation and getting to school for students in the Indian Spring attendance zone. And so we've taken three different points in the Indian Spring attendance zone, one up towards the top kind of northern edge of the attendance zone, one on the western or far left edge, but kind of in the center, and then one at the, the southwest corner, more or less, of the attendance zone to see how those routes to Indian Spring and Carver would compare. And so 
in the blue line from each of those dots, you see what the shortest path to Carver would look like. In the yellow line, you see what the shortest path to Indian Spring would look like for those three respective students. For our student that's the furthest to the north, it's actually a slightly shorter distance to Carver because of that kind of um, unique shape of the Indian Spring attendance zone. Uh, and then you start to pick up some distance as you go further south through the zone. So at the furthest point where you have a student who's actually kind of in that group of, of folks in the Crestview attendance zone who are actually attending Tennyson, but zoned to Indian Spring, if that student were going directly to Indian Spring, it would be about 4.1 miles. Going to Carver, it would be about 5.7. So the further south, the further west you go, the, the more there's a difference in the path that you would take between going to Indian Spring and Carver and the longer that distance gets. Um, but as you can see, kind of the same thing that we highlighted on the last map, there are a lot of students in the Crestview area of the Indian Spring attendance zone that in practice are actually going to Tennyson. Uh, if we can move to the next map, we're just gonna share the same thing looking focused on the Carver attendance zone where what kind of jumps out here is you don't see a large pocket of students. You see some students across the zone that are going to other schools, but you don't see that sort of large pocket or geographic area where a whole bunch of students are going there. It also in this view kind of highlights the way Indian Spring is um, at a far corner of the Indian Spring attendance zone and the area immediately around Indian Spring is not really providing a lot of students to Indian Spring. So there aren't a lot of students at Indian Spring that are inside that sort of two mile default for students that you might expect to walk instead of using bus services. And then if we go forward, you have just one more look at the maps for our middle schools. And we'll share all of these after the meeting when we share the slides so you can look at them in more detail, but you can see what uh, the area around Cesar Chavez looks like. Um, again, kind of you, not, nothing quite like that area of Indian Spring where you see geographically a large number of students or a large cluster of students going somewhere outside the zone. But we hope that gives you a, a better picture of where students are coming from in the zones and in particular, a better picture of how that unique shape of the Indian Spring zone affects where students zoned Indian Spring are going to school and what transportation would look like if some of those students, instead of going across that zone to go to Indian Spring, were going kind of across and up a bit um, to get to Carver Middle School. So I think that's the, the bulk of the questions that I was going to, to hit on following up on from our last meeting. As Jared noted earlier, we'll be going much more in depth with our demographer on some of the other outstanding questions that are there. Jared. Great. Thank you, Kyle. And I, I think if you stare at the dots long enough, they do make a picture for you. Hopefully it's maybe that of Thanksgiving dinner here. Uh, but I uh, really wanted to kind of come back to the very beginning of where we started as we're reaching, I'll say, our, our last meeting here to talk about, dive into some of the details of our campuses. And I just finished with or I, the idea of we're almost finished with setting the table. Uh, we've got almost all the plates out there and we're about ready to start filling our plates and moving forward. And so just wanted to remind everybody uh, here as we move forward through the process, what we're looking at. Uh, and so that really begins with the facility master plan process, uh, reminding everybody that we were looking at, uh, we're talking two different things here as we move forward, the facility master plan that has that vision for 10 or 15 years out into the future. Uh, and pair that with bond planning that usually addresses a three to year, five year period of supporting the facility master plan. Uh, as we've been working through this process, uh, we have not uh, discussed uh, further, but we're still looking at a potential November of 21 bond th this fall or a May of 22 bond. And you'll see uh, the relationship of continuing this process through the facilities master plan and the bond planning, uh, ultimately working towards a November bond, which would be called in August of this year or in the option B in the May of 22 bond is kind of picking the, some of those conversations back up, uh, ultimately working towards a February of 22 call for a bond uh, for a May of 22 bond. Of course, followed by project implementation uh, and construction there to follow. 
Uh, main thing out of this slide, again, remember, uh, no decisions have been made by the, at this point. The board is still going to evaluate here afterwards uh, how they would like to proceed based on recommendations from the community. Uh, but really important for tonight is that idea of the facilities master plan versus a bond program. Uh, and that really is highlighted here in the next slide as we look at uh, how we move forward. So to date, we've really been focusing in on items one through four about looking at uh, new or replacement facilities, talking about district-wide goals uh, and getting into a little bit of departmental needs as we get in that. But ultimately those elements will help make up the facility master plan. Uh, and that all of those projects over a 10 to 15 year period will a total amount. Uh, but then we will look at implementation and you'll see a little bit of that uh, tonight about what a potential phase one project could be. Uh, and that gets into the bond planning. So bottom line story here is there are usually multiple bond referendums uh, to be able to support a facility master plan, knowing that it, when you sit down to Thanksgiving dinner, you can't take the whole table with you as much as you would like to uh, moving forward. And then uh, additionally, kind of coming back to the beginning uh, is when we talk about the facilities master plan and we've looked through some of these categories, we've looked through all of these categories as we move forward about the facility assessment and educational suitability of the campuses, uh, about the vision of the district, and ultimately much like Kyle just went into, demographics and capacity about where students are coming and what that vision looks like moving forward. Uh, so again, very big picture items uh, for the facilities master plan uh, as we move forward, but we want to remind everybody that we are looking towards the future. So as we proceed tonight, uh, we wanted to present a few facility examples as we talk about elementary schools and Casey's going to guide us through the ex a couple examples here. Great, thank you. If you go to the next slide. So this here is an example, Charter Oak Elementary School. This is down in Belton. Uh, this is representative of a new um, uh, elementary school, not, not a renovated one. And so what you'll see on the top left is, you know, sort of a right size gym. You know, I know that's sort of, we've got some unique gyms across the district. Uh, down in the bottom left, you see a little more playful elements and sort of the corridors, you know, more kids scale, perhaps different colors, things brought down to a, a more reachable level for the, for the little kids. Up in the top right is a library. And here, I know many libraries and media centers around your district have been, are in pretty good shape, but a lot are not. And some of that has to do with flexible furniture, adequate lighting, adequate supervision. Okay. And then on the bottom right is a classroom. Again, just a flexible space, of course, natural light. And you'll notice a variety of different presentation or activities occurring in this space. It's not just. Okay, we've got someone that needs to mute. But can you go back, Casey? I want to. Yep. Um, I want to just say this was my school. I, I love it. Um, it was designed for about 780 students. And you can see the polished concrete in the halls and in the classrooms um, and just the really um, variety in the seating in the classrooms and then those little colorful blocks in that hallway or grade level box boxes to um, emphasize anything that, that the school wants to emphasize to the students as they're traveling to and from the cafeteria. So I'm really proud of this. This was actually um, a prototype model that the district had been using for several years and then tweaking on it over time uh, just to continue to listen to teachers and make it better. So I just wanted to add that. Thanks, Casey. Yeah, I, I forgot it was a prototype, you know, a couple of years <laughs> go away. So we can go on to the next one. And then this is an example of a renovated campus uh, to, ad to address um, permanent capacity. And so you'll notice on the bottom right, there's a whole bunch of portables. Those were moved there to support the phasing. And so sort of in the middle of the screen towards the bottom is the existing campus building. It's got a brown roof that looks very much like the dirt to the north of it. And then you can see sort of to the top left, you can see their gym facility and it's kind of strung out. And so the portables used to be tucked behind where that um, angled roof building is. 
and they move the portables off to the side to so the school can be continuously operational during the construction and they can safely um, segment off the construction zone. And so here, the, the goal was to augment the existing facilities while maintaining active campus. And so the new facilities focused on um, cafeteria, library, um, those support spaces, you know, often when portables are added to campus, your core areas are not up to par or not up to size, you know, to support that expanded population. So if we can go to the next page, these are all images. Uh, part of the renovation up to the top right is a new entry, you know, the original campus uh, to facilitate this larger capacity. They ended up moving the main entry from one side of campus to the other. So making it a prominent entry that people could find, you know, in a, in a school that had been around for quite a while. And then you'll notice in the images uh, surrounding that uh, much brighter colors, uh, taller ceiling, better lighting, much more natural light in the spaces, uh, more flexible furniture selections. And so they were able to tie it into the existing campus and carry colors and things across the campus so you get a cohesive feel. So then we can go to the next one. And this one, we're gonna transition over to key metrics. And these eight things that you see on the screen should be familiar to you at this point. Uh, we brought them up for the high school discussion and we brought them up for the middle school discussion. And these are lenses or things we're considering when we're evaluating options by we, I mean this entire group here. And you know, we've, we've gone into some detail um, on um, the high school and middle school, for example, we will talk a little bit about impact to curriculum. We've talked about um, ideal campus size, you know, in terms of staff allocations and parent and student interactions. We've also talked about enrollment and capacity. Um, but of course, we, we also consider the other items such as construction cost and balancing, you know, the facility conditions assessment needs and the learning opportunities needs. If we can go to the next slide. So lens one is, is always the impact to curriculum. I mean, absolutely the goal for Waco ISD is lifelong learners. And so the, the goal that we're keeping in mind every time we're talking about potentially new or renovated or improved facilities, we want to be able to support collaborative learning. We want to be able to support self-directed experiences. We want to be able to integrate critical thinking not only into the curriculum, but also opportunities through the facilities to help facilitate that. And then of course, you know, appreciative, appreciation of creativity and imagination. I mean, you think about, especially elementary specifically, you, so many good opportunities there. Um, in, in previous meetings like this for the high school and middle school, we've gone into deeper dive into enrollment and other things. You're gonna see those woven into these elementary school options that Jared's gonna walk you through. Great, thank you, Casey, for showing us what's possible on a new facility and a renovated facility and reminding us of that vision for educational uh, facilities. As we go tonight, we are gonna take a little bit different approach than we have at the middle schools and elementary schools. And we're gonna really focus on uh, two main ideas. One, what which, which we're calling the baseline option, uh, which you'll see is very familiar. And then the other is the long-term vision about setting goals to be able to look at how to address uh, the uh, elementary school needs across the district. And you'll see that it is a, a large challenge. And so we wanna make sure that we're headed in the right direction as we move forward. Uh, and we'll work through that feedback on that, that process. We do expect that the, these concepts will take uh, approximately two meetings to kind of go through. So it's not the only time we'll be able to discuss elementary schools. Uh, and it, I'll remind you, as Dr. McKinnon mentioned at the beginning, we're gonna go through these. It's a complicated set of issues. We'll pause before we go to the breakout so we can make sure that the entire group uh, has questions. So save up those questions, write them down, uh, and then we'll jump in and, and go from there. So the first one is the baseline option. And much like here that you see at, with the other uh, middle school and the high school campuses, we're looking at the facility condition assessments data and what it's telling us here across the 15 year period. So uh, with the help of School Dude, we we're able to look at each individual campus uh, and prioritize low, medium, and high needs across the campuses, uh, similar categories as you saw before, uh, and then look at district totals or campus totals across that 15-year period. 
Uh, so if you advance it one click here, you'll see that we're considering this the baseline option, uh, just like we have previously of addressing those facility condition assessment needs uh, that we're not necessarily addressing uh, educational space specifically. Uh, but here you're looking across 14 campuses, about 817,000 square feet of school, of course, the pre-K through fifth grade uh, and a capacity of 9,000 students. Uh, here you'll see that, you know, to do this, to address all the current needs uh, from the facility condition assessment, somewhere around 190 to $210 million. So there's a lot of need here uh, over that next 15 year period. And as we've talked about middle schools, high schools, and now elementary schools, it's not something that can be accomplished all in one bite. Uh, and we know that moving forward. Uh, so this is really where we want to depart and really look at the data to determine uh, what is it telling us and how do we want to move forward. Uh, so remember baseline option and we'll come back to some of the discussion for all 15 or oh, sorry all 14 campuses across 15 years uh, is a, a, the 190 to 200 million dollars. So as we set out uh, and we look at the facility master plan, uh, we really want to think about that vision moving us forward. What is going to take us from where we are today and how do we move forward? What is the data we want to analyze? So we want to put on that, those big picture thoughts, uh, be able to look forward out into the future and decide where we want to go uh, and then start making the right steps moving forward. And so as Casey mentioned, we're going to jump into a little bit deeper into the lenses here as, as we look at educational or elementary uh, facilities. And the first is as we contrast the facilities condition assessment and educational suitability data. So on this graph, uh, this is very similar to what we saw for the middle school and high school, but of course there are more dots uh, on there. Uh, and these dots do have significance. You'll notice uh, along the X axis, the horizontal axis is the facility condition assessment. And along the left or the vertical axis is educational suitability. And these are contrasted. And so part of the discussion will be, uh, or the idea is the top right quadrant, quadrant so Bells Hill, uh, is one of the highest educational, highest facility condition assessment. And as you go to the bottom left, so campuses like Alta Vista or Crestview have some of the most greatest challenges. And so as a group, we will want to look at where we draw the line. Uh, and so if you look at, as you draw the line, uh, you'll want to start looking at how we address the facilities or what, what are we doing to the various facilities across the district. So this line, uh, as you see on the screen, would suggest uh, as you click one more, uh, you'll see then that we're looking to address this group of facilities. There's about nine facilities there uh, that include that Alta Vista and Crestview that have the highest need, but between the facility condition assessment and educational suitability. So there's the greatest opportunity uh, to make improvements within the district within this core group of facilities. So we're thinking about here with this slide, what are, what are the condition of the educational spaces and facility condition assessment? We also want to look at the geographic location of these facilities. And so as we start looking at the map of Waco ISD, uh, on the next slide, you'll see uh, this is very similar to what uh, we saw from uh, Kyle's slide, but these are focused on the elementary school. And so each red block represents one of the campuses within the district. Uh, and I'll point out, I'll start contrasting some of the information here as we move forward. Uh, so these are the, the 14 campuses, uh, plus they're uh, what I'll call the specialty campuses. Uh, like Hillcrest and Lake Air Montessori. Uh, but across the rest of the district, you'll notice that kind of in the core center of the district, you'll see there's six blocks in the center with white uh, outlines. And those represent the newest and uh, the schools that represent the top right of the quadrant. And it just so happens these are also the six schools that have been addressed within the last 20 years uh, with uh, campuses like Provident Heights being built in the early 2000s, uh, or you look at Dean Highlander, Bells Hill, that were constructed here within the last 10 years. Uh, and then the group at the bottom left, uh, which actually ring, you'll see the uh, squares without an outline from Cedar Ridge at the top left, working clowner, counterclockwise to Kendrick, Alta Vista, and South Waco. Those are some of the older campuses and did not receive as much attention in the previous bond program. 
Uh, so we start considering, you know, how does the geographic location start affecting decisions as we balance out that facility condition assessment and as well and educational suitability. As we advance to the next slide, we start looking at the demographic information. Uh, so very much like we looked at the middle school and the high school data, as we look at this information, you'll see that current enrollment uh, in the 2020-2021 school year is about 7,500 students. And as you look out to the right, uh, about 10 years out, that will range from the 7,700 estimated next year to about 8,200 at the end of the at the end of that 10 year period. Again, you'll see that there are ups and downs uh, through that time period and roughly remains flat. So as we look at what is the need identified to be able to support this. And so right now, the current capacity of the uh, all the elementary schools is sitting at about 9000 students. And that's it. all the, the K-5 facilities with the exception of Lake Air Montessori. So you'll see a little bit of a difference uh, between the capacity in those two numbers. And that's the, the one difference there. And so when we talk about the minimum capacity needed, meaning over that 10 year period, what is the maximum number of students that we would see, uh, you would see that the 7294, which actually occurs in 2031 is the maximum number of students that would be enrolled in the K-5 in total in the district. For planning purposes, we generally look at about 5% uh, to be comfortable within the student or within a the capacity of the school. So that would say roughly the 76, 78, so about 7,700 students would be the optimum enrollment across the district to align number of seats available, as well as then the number of students enrolled within the district. So the last, last leg that we want to look at is then the elementary school staffing. And you'll again see that this is similar information uh, that was presented two meetings ago as we look a little bit deeper. Uh, and so again, we'll highlight very similar to the middle schools, the three columns on the left represent a single 750 student elementary school. And you'll see that operational costs are roughly $3.5 million. If you look at two smaller schools at 375, so they're equally split, you would look at operational cost of about $4.2 million. So as you look at a shift from two campuses to one campuses at the elementary school, you would be just a touch under $600,000 a year in annual staffing. And why is this important? Uh, you'll additionally note there are uh, additional options in terms of uh, educational support. So as you look at categories like the primary literacy aid, you would see at a single campus, you would have actually more aids at the campus uh, than at an individual smaller school. So there's not only some operational cost efficiency, but there's an also an enhancement of support at the elementary school level. So lots of data there. So as we move forward, so again, remind everybody as we move forward and we look, uh, we look it looked at the facility condition assessment, educational suitability, analyzing that data. We're looking at the geographic data, uh, as well as the enrollment and capacity from the demographics. Uh, and additionally, are considering how we're staffing the schools as we move forward. And so as we get to the option, uh, the first option here tonight, we really wanted to think back to that facility master plan and how we move forward. And we want to do that by really looking at what are the goals uh, that we want to set that's guide, going to guide that vision for the next 10 to 15 year period. So Jessica, if you'll take us forward one here. And so what we've looked at uh, for that long term vision for the facility master plan is First is that we want to address schools with the highest need uh, within the district. Uh, that means that we're the highest need. We're going to provide additional education. We want to provide additional educational support staff, uh, so much like we talked, but it also increase operational efficiencies. Uh, and then finally, we want to align ca campuses and capacities to that projected 10 year need over multiple bond programs. And Jessica, I think we've got, we want to shift uh, to a different presentation here because I think we've got a little bit of different data. 
Is it all right if, if you unshare and I share here? Sorry about that, guys. We made one last minute edit here as we move forward. Uh, so as we talk here tonight is, so we have those long-term vision goals, uh, those three goals that we identified. And then we started looking at the schools and how we move those forward. So again, kind of aggregating the, that data, we would identify two groups of schools. Uh, one, the first group would be a minor to moderate need. So that would include the seven schools you see here on the screen from West Avenue, Provident Heights, Brook Avenue, Dean Highland, J.H. Hines and Bells Hill, and finally Lake Air Montessori. As we look at the second category of schools, those would be those that would fall on that moderate to significant need. So Crestview, Alta Vista, Parkdale, Cedar Ridge, Mountain View, South Waco, Kendrick, and Hillcrest, PDS. So as we look at intersecting those goals and the long-term vision, uh, as well as the lenses, uh, as we move forward, we would look to address those in two different ways. Uh, so first is on the minor to moderate need, we would look at maintaining the existing campuses by addressing the facilities condition assessment and the educational suitability needs. So basically meaning that we're gonna maintain the parts and pieces that support that building, as well as improve some of the educational needs within those campuses. As we look at the second category, uh, we're gonna look at those eight campuses uh, and we're gonna look at potentially addressing new and or renovated elementary schools over that time period. So that means over the next 10 to 15 years, we'll look as we step through the process to be able to address those needs that best suits the district uh, and the community at that time. You'll additionally note uh, there between the two at the bottom, you'll see that those existing campuses that in the minor to moderate need would support just under 4,200 student capacity. Uh, so as we look through the moderate to significant need, we'd wanna make sure those campuses provide a minimum of 3,750 students to meet that maximum enrollment capacity over time. So I'm actually gonna pause there uh, and we've, covered a lot of ground very quickly, actually. And so I wanna see if there are any questions uh, about the data and how we led up to uh, these long-term goals and ultimately these strategies here. Jared, the first, this is Casey. The first one I saw in the chat is um, confusion about the capacity. Um, the Somebody saw the enrollment of just over 8,000, the capacity needs is 7,600. 7, I know you said it, could you repeat it for those that didn't see it on the slide? So I'll, I'll bring that slide back up. Uh, so again, yes, the, the current capacity, and this is where uh, I will say that we work to have fidelity in the data. Uh, the current capacity you'll see in the far left column is at 9,940 students. Uh, and that includes all the elementary schools, plus it includes Lake Air Montessori, uh, which is actually a K-8 campus rather than a K-5 campus. And so just for simplicity, as we were looking at analyzing elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, we wanted to look at just the K-5 campuses uh, for simplicity here. So the current capacity when we say is 9,020 students, that's the 9940 less and you'll see here at Lake Air Montessori 920 to bring that capacity at 9,020 students uh, within the district. <clears throat> Casey, were there any other questions or did the group have any other questions? I, I saw another one in here. Um, when was the last time Waco ISD had a facilities master plan and how far into the future did it plan for? Uh, I, I don't know that specific question. I'd have to lean on Dr. Cannon or Kyle if they know that information. Yeah, I, I don't know. I know, you know, there was a, the last, I think, facility, major facilities work was likely university high school, but I would defer to maybe a board member who has a recollection of that. Mr. Sykes? Yes, I, I think your reference to university is right. We did have a master plan done at that time. I don't think it took us out uh, uh, to the full 15-year period, but uh, uh, 
the, the plan, very similar process here that identified the needs across the district and tried to identify the biggest needs and the, the, the lesser needs. So I would say it's probably been between 15 and 20 years. Okay. Well, and here before we move on, and I just want to make sure the group is understanding kind of the how the data led to the these the long term vision and goals, uh, and ultimately the strategies between the two groupings of campuses there, because uh, that'll definitely help set the stage as we move forward. But want to make sure as a group we have consensus about that understanding. And Mr. Sykes, there's another question there about did we complete the plan the uh, plan at that time? Yeah, the, to the extent the plan was developed specifically addressing the needs of the bond election, of course, all the bond money was spent. So I would say, uh, albeit the plan was not as extensive as what we're talking about here, but at that time, the plan was implemented throughout the district uh, using the funds that were identified through the bond election. So, um, you know, it did have a starting point and a stopping point until those bond funds were, were spent. Thank you. So Aaron asked a question about Lake Air Montessori and right now that the, that was based on, the question was, is, why is Lake Air Montessori not in the bottom left quadrant and ultimately the condition of the facilities that, that we looked at actual numbers uh, relative to each other. Uh, that's where it placed it on the graph uh, for all intents and purposes is that it had out of that grouping uh, stood in between the top right and the lower left quadrant. And so, Jared, the next one in the chat is I'm seeing what is the experience of our consultants over time? Are most districts able to complete their master plans? Uh, so I'll, I'll speak from our perspective of uh, we're currently working with Round Rock ISD uh, and you saw the uh, Westwood campus. That master plan was originally developed in 2007 uh, and sequentially the district has not only addressed Round Rock uh, or Westwood campus, but several other campuses within the district uh, in the master plan process. So mul multiple bond programs uh, and really moving each campus forward. And that's how they were able to balance uh, the bonding capacity with everything else. Additionally, you'll see that Austin ISD is going through a similar process right now with bond programs, setting a master plan and ultimately making sequential steps uh, and there, they are having to sometimes do group A first and then group B second and then back to A. Yeah, and I, I would add to that, having um, done facilities work for a long time myself um, and kind of similar to what our board president just put in the chat box that is that the work is incremental. So it really doesn't end. Um, you, you really should be continually working on improving your facilities uh, and it, it's just, it's hard work, it takes a lot of money and it does carry forward over a lot of time. Okay, well, we'll, we'll keep going uh, here as we move forward. Uh, and as we look at this long-term vision for the facility master plan, it brings the question, what might be a phase one here as we move forward? And that phase one uh, here, what you'll see, oh, excuse me there, one too many clicks, uh, would be uh, an initial approach would be is as we start aggregating that data uh, and looking at the highest and best use of needs and funds, where do we start addressing it? So as we look at a geographic location, uh, we start looking at how do we uh, address campuses and where are they located at? Uh, so you'll see in this case, and this will be the theme of it, is that we are looking at addressing Alta Vista, Kendrick, and South Waco, uh, three campuses that are closely grouped together. 
Uh, so that's number one. Number two is we look at the, the facility condition assessment and educational suitability. Uh, so in particular, Alta Vista has one of the uh, lowest educational suitability scores uh, and Kendrick has one of the lowest facility condition assessment scores. And a lot of that is based on the age of the facility, the configuration, how they're being used within the, the campus level. Uh, and then finally, we look at enrollment as well as then capacity of the facility. So of those three facilities, you'll notice uh, capacity, we're slightly over, the, we have 1,500 students attending those three schools with a capacity of about 1,800 students. Uh, but what's really interesting is, is it's actually a mixed bag between permanent and actual capacity. So specifically Kendrick uh, has more students attending it. It is over capacity. Uh, current, last year, there were 524 students and their permanent capacity is 500 students. What does that mean? It means they're actually using portables on the campus uh, to be able to meet that need. And so the concept here as we move forward would be is as we look at the data, we identify the highest and best use. We're suggesting that a phase one would address Kendrick, Alta Vista, and uh, South Waco campuses. And so how do we do that? Uh, we start looking at an approach uh, to those campuses. Uh, so when we compare and contrast the baseline option, which is addressing the facility condition assessment needs only, we would estimate those 2020 project costs at 25 to $35 million. So again, that is improving the systems, uh, that is not addressing the educational space within the facilities, it's keeping them as is, uh, as they are. So then as we look and how do we move forward uh, to be able to do those, it, to address those three campuses, the long-term vision right now, what we're proposing is a new elementary school at Kendrick. So it would be a replacement facility and we're continuing to study, but we would look at a new or renovated school at South Waco Elementary School. So that would bring capacity and locate capacity relative to the 1500 to be able to meet the needs. Uh, and here that estimated 2020 project total cost would be between 50 and $75 million, depending upon where we, whether we look at that renovated facility for the $50 million to a new facility for $75 million. So again, we'll take a pause here uh, and see if there are any questions that you have. Uh, but again, that's, it's based on the facility master plan, setting those goals up front, where is that highest need and best use, uh, and then as we move forward. So again, we wanna make sure that as a group, we have a collective understanding of what we're doing. Uh, and so any questions that you have, feel free to ask or send them in the chat. And I see Ms. Alvarado asked about what would happen with Alta Vista. And so much like Indian Spring, we would look at repurposing uh, that campus to another use uh, sometime in the future. So in essence, we would move students between, balance the students between Kendrick and South Waco uh, for those 1500 students. Uh, Josh asked, uh, is Alta Vista the oldest facility? Yes, it is the oldest facility. And I believe, yes, it was built, as I recall, either 1916 or 1919 uh, is what I recall. And so then Chris uh, identified that concerned our facilities have aged to such a degree. She likes the idea of a master plan. Do you want some more information on how we convince? Uh, I, I think uh, convince, and I'll, I'll keep with the high level of data. I think uh, the goal of the facilities master plan is identifying the data uh, and the understanding of the condition of the existing campuses, what it takes to improve them, uh, as well as settling that setting that bar for expectations for campuses within in the district. Uh, but to, as well, communicating that information out. So just like we're working with you as a group, it's great for you to be an advocate for the same process of communicating out what's happening within the district. Now I'll, I'll see if Dr. Cannon or one of the board members or maybe Amy has any additional thoughts on that one. 
Yeah, I think ongoing communication about um, the district's needs and giving overview presentations of the work of this committee um, is essential to keeping the community connected to move forward with multiple bond refer referendums. And I also think, um, you know, just going back and reminding the, the community of the work that we, that we do um, and showing them, you know, that we were good um, stewards of their taxpayer, of their money. And of course, uh, your great team like Kyle and Josh can help work on that messaging and support district communication that can make it out to the community as well. Uh, so there were two questions uh, from, from Misty uh, about addressing elementary uh, is, would there only be two elementary schools? And yes, uh, the idea is that Kendrick, South Waco and Alta Vista would then be supported by two elementary schools in that zone, in those zones. Yeah, I think for Alta Vista, it might be, and Kyle might want to chime in here, but it might be important for us to bring back some similar maps to show where the kids are attending Alta Vista from and where um, where the students live. So we could do something similar next time. Kyle, would you add any information here about Alta Vista? Yeah, the only thing that I would add tonight is we're actually pulling a significant number of students across I-35 to attend um, Alta Vista. That's another place where there's kind of a, an unusual looking attendance boundary that doesn't necessarily fit um, the road. So that so a, a, a very significant chunk of the students are coming from that area kind of to the north that you see that comes up between the Kendrick and Bells Hill attendance zones. But we can bring you a more detailed look at that at a few. Sounds like Kyle's having fun with his kids as well, running around, so. Uh, so as we move forward, and Ida definitely had some opinions uh, about kind of the interpretation, and that's really what we're wanting to focus on tonight here in our breakout activity is we want to get feedback on this. Uh, so uh, we want to touch base on, on two questions tonight uh, as a reminder. So the first uh, thing that we want feedback on is the facility master plan vision moving forward is what is that long-term vision and ultimately are these the goals that best support facilities within Waco ISD as we move forward? And if these are the goals, the question then is, is this approach with Kendrick, South Waco and Alta Vista the right phase one here as we move forward? So uh, it looks, there's one more question here, I believe. Oh, uh, so it sounds like we have three smaller older schools and it makes more sense financially resource. So in this essence, yes, Aaron, to answer Aaron's, Aaron's question is, uh, does it make more sense financially and for the resources for the students to have two medium sized schools? And yes, that is what we're proposing is, is that two schools uh, would address the ongoing maintenance and operation uh, that are needed at the campuses. There's some operational efficiency and enhanced educational resources. Uh, and then as well, geographically and demographics, it starts working out as well. And so unless there are any other questions, uh, we're going to uh, break into the, the three groups tonight uh, and we'd like to hear from all the community members to be able to provide feedback uh, on the goals and these options moving forward. And so uh, Aaron did ask one question uh, about keeping the three schools as is means a lot of duplication and potentially lower outcomes for students. Uh, and so I know from a staffing standpoint, yes, there would be some duplication like in having three principals, uh, but I'll let Dr. Cannon or the district address the uh, other half of that question. I'm sorry, the, uh, we were talking about uh, three to two and Aaron's comment, correct? Uh, Go ahead, sorry. 
Would you clarify the question you're wanting the, to answer, yeah. Jerry? The question is, uh, if you maintain the three schools, does that impact outcomes for students? Well, I, you know, there are a lot of variables and outcomes for students. Um, and so I would go back to educational vision and, um, look, you know, looking at what we're trying to establish in terms of facilities and the kinds of spaces we want for our students. So, um, you know, I think it's efficiencies in the number of students, but also there are just so many variables with instruction and um, professional development and preparation of our teachers. So it would be hard to say um, for sure that, you know, two versus three would be better or not better, but I'd say two um, improved facilities would certainly um, facilitate the kind of instruction that we're talking about. And I apologize for the squeaky toy <laughs> in the background. And then Chris did ask a question I see on Cedar Ridge, and I would bring back uh, this, this chart, uh, which there you'll see Cedar Ridge does fall within that moderate to significant need. Uh, and so then as we progress, what this is saying is over time, Cedar Ridge will need to be looked at uh, in a similar uh, response to have a new or renovated elementary school uh, through the facility master plan. Uh, and then Christina asked about, to clarify, is the 50 to $75 million two new schools or only one? And so right now, what we are currently studying, and this is where we really wanted to get the feedback, is the $50 million leans toward a new elementary school at Kendrick and a renovated South Waco, and the $75 million leans towards two new facilities, one for Kendrick and one for South Waco. And there's some middle ground there in the middle. Uh, and then a uh, community advisory committee number seven identified that Kendrick, South Waco, and Alta Vista, uh, the classrooms for their various grade levels don't meet the current state requirements of the 800 square foot minimum. Uh, and that is correct, uh, is that at the age they were built, uh, we looked yesterday, South Waco is roughly about 650 square feet per student. I've not looked at the other campuses to know them off the top of my head. So any final uh, questions? Just going back to Chris's question about Cedar Ridge. So, I, you know, I think the, the, those are additional phases that can be added to the plan. And so the option tonight just begins with a conversation about phase one. Thank you, Jared. No problem. And so then uh, I've seen kind of several comments uh, in, in the chat uh, about the, I'll say the opinions about the solutions. And that's really what we want to hear here in the breakout uh, as we look at, uh, yes, looking at taking the students at Alta Vista and spreading them to new and or renovated facilities at Kendrick and South Waco, uh, as well as again, those long-term goals about addressing the highest need, addressing staff and operational efficiencies, uh, and then addressing overall district capacity. <clears throat> and so any final questions uh, before we go? There's a question in there about why, Al why Alta Vista is the one that's being repurposed. You wanna talk about facilities conditions with that, Jared? Sure. Uh, so I'd say there's several different uh, elements with Alta Vista. So number one, it is the oldest campus uh, it does have the greatest need. Uh, if you recall the presentation from Kevin uh, two meetings ago, I, I don't know specifically, but it is one of the campuses that had the greatest damage uh, from the winter event. Uh, and again, that is just that is based on what occurred there at the campus, but also the insulation that's in the walls, it's older construction, doesn't have as many safety elements as far as required by current code. Uh, and then as well, just the layout of the campus and the size of the room starts becoming challenges when we talk about the educational suitability. So it's, it's also a, a tinier, smaller piece of property. Yep. So that there's less opportunity to build adjacent uh, on a facility on that property. So. I would say no particular thought 
um, yet in regards to repurposing it for um, Dr. Rowe. Okay, well, ho hopefully everybody uh, ha has their comments ready and I will ask Josh to break us out into our three rooms. Uh, we're gonna have about 20 minutes. Uh, we're not planning to do a report out at, at this point. Uh, for the comments, we're really looking at getting feedback uh, on these two options and collecting the feedback. So we will see everybody in the next room uh, and then we will come back and close things out for this evening. Hi, good evening, everyone. How are you? Just fine. Um, great, great to see you all. I am gonna be gathering your input on these options in the elementary school um, kind of future vision here tonight. And I did wanna add one thing, Jared's last comment, just for clarification. He mentioned that we're not gonna be reporting out on this. We're not gonna be reporting out tonight. So we wanted to provide enough in, enough time for everybody to give their feedback and we're going to be documenting all the feedback and then we'll summarize and share that back at the next meeting because we're going to continue this discussion on elementary schools at the next meeting. So uh, really wanted to make sure that we spent plenty of time talking about the options and um, gathering your feedback. So we can kind of go around the Zoom room and I could start in the top left of my screen or, or you can raise hands and I can call on you however you all want to participate. Um, Let's say anybody? Raise, yeah. Raise, let, let people raise hands. Okay, raise hands, that sounds good. I will, um, so you can use the raise hand reaction. It's kind of like a clapping hand. Um, that's in the bottom of your screen under reactions, or you can raise your hand like this and I'll try to call on people. Anybody want to start us off? I am looking. Hey, I would. Okay, um, I think I think as a, an Alta Vista, mem uh, Vista member, I think it's a little disheartening um, to hear that Alta Vista is on the chopping block. Um, you know, it's just, it's been through so much and I just feel like it's just a really good um, school. So to hear that it would be separated, is, is very disheartening. Okay. And I, I, um, I don't think we have all the details yet about separating or necessarily being on the chopping block, but I do hear what you're saying and I'm going to write it down exactly the way you said it. Okay, uh, Mr. Bledsoe, is that Mr. Is I can't see very yeah, well. So sorry, no, that's okay. I just kind of have a bigger, um, big picture question. I, the way this is being presented, um, and I understand now, like tonight, we've gotten into like, okay, we're going to do multiple bond elections, but I just wonder how much honest feedback are you guys really getting? Um, because we're all big, I mean, we're WISD Waco people, so we want the best, I want the best option for every school. And if you start looking at those numbers, I mean, we're going to be over a billion dollars over how many bond elections are we talking about? And so I guess what I would like to know, like, is kind of that. I mean, what's the 15 year plan? Are we talking about a billion dollars over? four bond elections, something that would be, I mean, that's four $250 million bond packages. Is that going to be palatable to, to the voters? I'm, I'm just trying to give you honest feedback of what I think, but just sitting here with pie in the sky, I want to, I want to tell you, well, let's just do the best thing. Let's do option a for everything. Sure. Does that, does that make sense? Yes. Mr. Sykes, do you want to make a comment? You're on mute. You're still on mute, Mr. Sykes. Sorry. Thank Good you. question, Taylor. Uh, this is kind of the scenario that took place, what, in that 12 to 15 year period beforehand in that last bond election. And it, it entails bonding capacity. You hit it right on the head. I mean, we run out of capacity at some point in time uh, within 10 years, 15 years or beyond, okay? so. Right. Our task is to look at the needs, needs assessment, and try to fit that within the context of the community's input, 
gathering up the input and fitting that within our bonding capacity. Whether that's, you know, one bond on the front end with, with you know, broken down into, you know, three smaller increments right. or uh, uh, ranging from five to 10 years with planned bonds. Now, there's all sorts of impediments with that. And that's kind of what, you know, did the uh, full job on that earlier bond. But as we have vision looking out, we try to fit it everything, you know, sometimes, you know, square blocks into a round hole and make it work across the district. Okay. Sure. So you're correct. You know, we, you know, the, the, the funds are, are, very difficult to find in terms of bonds, in terms of bond planning and bond, bond capacity, but at least we're putting everything on the table right now, trying to come up with the best planned approach within uh, limitations that we have uh, going forward. And I know sure. I'm kind of, you know, moving back and forth on that, but it's a moving no. target. And well, I mean, I get, I mean, I mean, we, we need to do a billion dollars worth of work. That's the, that's the honest answer. Right. Um, it just, I, one, I don't know what our bonded capacity is. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, well, below a billion dollars. <laughs> but, yeah. but that I, presentation I, I is coming. That that presentation right. is coming. So, okay. um, yeah. Thank you, Mr. I, Sykes. That was way better than I could have answered. Helped with that question. No problem. <laughs> and sure. I think I would just add to that that. Um, this is part of the process is for you to think big and dream big and we'll, we'll begin narrowing down as we get that um, bonding capacity information to you, then we'll be coming back to you. Okay, now that you know this, now what do you think? Because um, we don't want to cut off the conversation too early. Thank you for that. Is that sure. Robin, are you raising a hand? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, and, and just to add to that, we did have a presentation on the bond capacity within the last month. And so that presentation, I think, is still available. Um, if you look at the agendas for the school board meeting, there was a there was a PowerPoint presentation that talked about bond capacity that I know for me, sometimes looking at it gives me a better picture than kind of hearing about it. And I know there's going to be a presentation here as well, but that information is, is there um, if you're interested in looking at it before it gets presented formally to the committee. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Okay, anyone else have uh, some other comments or feedback you wanna share? Ms. Rowe, were you raising a hand? You're on mute. I'm reviewing, I'm reviewing the purpose of our breakout. So were we tonight in this breakout going to decide whether we want phase one or the two schools in South Waco? We're, we're, not, is our outcome? we're not deciding anything. We're just providing input and, and your opinion and your thoughts on those options. Yes, on uh, the pros and cons or perceived opportunities and challenges that you think of when we talk about a new replacement facility possibly combining two campuses um, into one and then a renovation potentially or new school at South Waco. Well, I was intrigued when I heard the word repurpose for Alta Vista in regard to the arrangement of having the two new schools and repurposing Alta Vista. And I was curious to what that repurpose might include because I know over time out of this has sort of emerged like a patchwork quilt. It's just been added to and added to. And if we could have two new facilities in that community, I think it would be great. Great, thank you. And I don't think that there are any plans yet on what Alta Vista would be repurposed for, but the thought is absolutely to, you know, consider repurpose options in the future. Anyone else want to chime in and provide some feedback? Looking at my screen. They're clearly over under using several facilities. So some of them need to be consolidated at a minimum, but to bring them up to date, um, 
there are likely a lot of things that could be done with the older schools to utilize them would certainly uh, be a positive for the students. Um, all the schools that I went to that were repurposed, a couple of them needed to be torn down. Um, but I, I certainly appreciate those that, that you have fond memories of. Uh, mine were old enough, my memories weren't that fond. Thank you. Let's see, anyone else have a comment? Some of you I know have thoughts because you've spoken up before in the breakout rooms I was in. Amy, I was about to say something. Um, I do, I, it is, I agree with what Nancy said earlier that it's a little disheartening to hear about Alta Vista, mostly because I know the wonderful staff that's over there my organization works closely with them. I feel like they've made tremendous strides uh, over the past few years. But I can also recognize the, the kind of situation of that building <laughs> and the, the, the school itself, and it is old, and they have dealt with a lot of um, kind of unusual circumstances. They don't even have their library operational right now. So I, I can get some of that. I, I do think it's the campus that makes the most sense um, if you're looking at those three campuses on that side of town, um, you know, I like the idea of new school buildings. I will also say, though, um, and, and not to throw a wrench in some of this, because I recognize the, how challenging these decisions are and, and trying to think through how to best kind of approach this. But I, I want to also say that I've heard several folks on these calls over the last couple months or so. Uh, talk a little bit about equity. And I know that um, when we're thinking about equity, classroom size is a part of that, especially when we're thinking about the impact of classroom size on communities, students of color, of low income students. And so I just wonder if that is also a part of this planning process and having any consideration um, when we're thinking about combining campuses like this and, and building new structures, not just with the enhanced education opportunities, but also thinking through classroom size. That absolutely will be considered in the process. Great comments. Let's see, who else has been quiet? We've got probably got about five more minutes. So I don't know, Lisa, Cheryl, Alfred, Joy, some of you who I can't see your picture, Julie, Juana, Vera, anybody wanna make any other comments to share? Ms. Ms. Rowe? The experience that I've had with some of the schools that you talked about earlier with Bells Hill and I think the Hines and whatever was the other new elementary, well, newest elementary campus. I know that those campuses have facilities for the community so that they're able to bring the community in and do a lot more with parents and the community and bridge that gap. And so I would hope that if we have these two new elementary campuses, that we can do a bigger picture of serving the students and the families and the community. And I think right now that's sort of limited. Great comment. I'm, I'm making note of that. Any other comments like that on what you would like to see, some of the opportunities in a plan uh, like this? And are there any comments on uh, just, you know, maybe focusing on the, the, just the facility improvements that are on the list, the maintenance type issues and, and minimal? Are we, any kind of thoughts on Hi, this is Chris Collins. Okay. 
Um, I, I was just thinking through, uh, you know, with, with older facilities, especially ones that were built in, built in the early 1900s. I mean, the world of, of um, compliance has changed so much that, um, you know, ADA compliance and those types of things um, really make it more challenging to adjust the schools uh, to meet those standards and, you know, that it's not providing the um, level of, of accessibility for, for students that may have some type of, a, of a, a physical challenge or something. So, you know, I appreciate the, the, the history of those schools, um, but we won't, you know, if we're thinking about um, being able to serve all of the students um, within the district, that, that is definitely something that we would wanna make sure that we're taking into consideration as well. Great comment, thank you. I, I feel much like I felt in the meetings uh, that focused on the middle schools and high schools that um, kind of just doing the maintenance is really just a band-aid. And, and we have campuses that are older and they don't meet our kids' educational needs and they can't provide equity on in, in these, in for their students. And so, um, yeah, I, I'm kind of, you know, what Mr. Bledsoe said earlier, I, I want the newest and best for our students as, you know, with the consideration that obviously we have to figure out a way to make that work. Um, so, you know, if that's what we're, if we're kind of discussing about the options, I mean, I, I think newer and renovated is better than just trying to keep um, doing upkeep on these three existing campuses. Great, thank you for that. And uh, Ms. Lee, did I see a hand go up or was were you just applauding Ms. Houston's comments? No, ma'am, I wasn't, um, but I did wanna kind of respond. I am the principal at South Lake, but I just happened to be in the group. Um, I was, I'm glad that our campus is being looked at as one of the campuses to be either new or um doing some improvements on it. But I really wanted to say too, is just like you said, putting a Band-Aid on and you're really trying to add more people to the campus and you want to make it a place where everyone wants to come and be. I know right now with our building, we have a lot of infrastructure problems when we're trying to do internet or whatever. We try to get some updates throughout the years. Um, and I think right now as a one-to-one, -one, they're really doing a great improvement, but I think we really want to focus on not just putting a Band-Aid on it, but actually improving it so it's a spotlight for the community and those that are coming over to join the campus, it's a place where people want to go. It's a place where people want to be. So really thinking about that in that facet. Great, thank you. Appreciate that. Hey, I think we've got a, a couple minute or two. I'm not sure when they're gonna cut us off. So anybody wanna get their comment in here before we get the hook? Anyone else have a comment on the, just the minimum, taking care of the minimum uh, versus trying to begin an effort to create some new facilities? Okay, y'all are a quiet group tonight. Mm -hmm. Getting hot out, everybody's getting tired. Mr. Sykes, I, I think you're on mute. I hit it, but it didn't go. Okay, there we go. Uh, it's interesting because the process of evaluating the facilities conditions assessment versus new properties, whether you talk about elementary, middle or high, high school level, um, there's, there's certainly parallels there. So uh, I, I think that as we gather this data and kind of compile everything, um, the notion of a Band-Aid is, is kind of lingered around a long time. So. What I'm hearing from all the groups is kind of uh, focused on new is better. 
Uh, I think there's good support from the community to look at putting packages together that will support new. But as we've discussed in the other campuses, the other levels, uh, it's like a, a, a big puzzle that needs to be put together. So the demographers are gonna play a, an important role on that. Uh, the community in those respective uh, uh, neighborhood schools are gonna be a, an important factor there. So I, I, I think we all want new, we all want better, but we've got to fit that into the context of, uh, and I'm the same way, because we have been handling Band-Aids a long time. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see an avenue to uh, shift that into a, a new gear, so to speak. Great, absolutely. How about a thumbs up before we leave the breakout room here for, for those comments and for everybody who provided input. Really, really appreciate y'all. You guys have been a great group throughout this whole process. All right, so as we're gathering up here, this is Casey Nicholson, I'm with O'Connor Robertson. Um, the goal here is just to sort of gather feedback, talk things out. Um, again, we're gonna be coming back in the next meeting to really vote and decide and direct. And here it's just get really gathering feedback so we can get you guys more information or perhaps uh, get you, find out more details. I think for me, it makes sense that um, the sensible part is, is that Alta Vista would be the campus that would be split because I do feel like Kendrick and South Waco are in two different areas. And so Alta Vista, I feel is closer to Kendrick. So, I mean, and because it's smaller, but of course that's the sensible part, but then you start thinking about the community that it does serve. So I can see why so many would be against that, you know, because they have an established community there and and there's a school community that's been built there and in the campus. So I can understand why many would be apprehensive about that. But um, I think Kendrick's at a good location where it's at in the community that it serves. And like I said, South Waco too, they're, they're not close. You know, um, I think that's a, I think those are great ideas for them to get two new schools. I, I, again, <laughs> having grown up in the Alta Vista neighborhood, I, I, getting rid of Alta Vista and repurposing it for anything other than a school for students in that community would be a loss for that community. It would not serve the students whatsoever. It, it's, it would, I would only think that maybe it's serving someone else because the purpose, we all know that students learn in, in smaller environments where the teacher has more one-on-one -on -one time with the students and making larger classes are not the, the, the way to go. It's, it's the opposite. And so you, when you're saying, let's close down Alta Vista and let's take, make all the kids that walk to Alta Vista now take the bus to these other schools. Now, now you're, you're interrupting their normal transportation for the parents and now they're having to fight for time with the teacher in these bigger classes new schools but much bigger classes and now they're at a disadvantage the numbers might show one thing but if you sit down with the students they're not they're being um the quality of education is being taken away and i, I personally my sisters went to alta vista in the 90s late 90s. having a a new beautiful facility um, for those two campuses that could effectively serve the community. And I'm thinking kind of like how um, Bells Hill does in, in that neighborhood. Um, it serves at a resource as a resource to the community and even to other schools into the district. Um, I really like the idea of having that in South Waco. Um, so I don't like the idea of closing schools, but I know that the, uh, the Alta Vista campus ha, ha, can't, I mean, it's, I feel like our hands are tied as a district that with that school. Great. Thank you, Andrea. 
It also seemed whenever you put the uh, the attendance in context with the consolidation, that that made some sense. That you have some, I think you called it misalignment, but that's that certainly seemed to be the case, and it seemed like it was a a fair assessment and uh, made sense to try and consolidate that and get those numbers back lined up like they should be. It kind of that that was one of the first thoughts that I had was whenever it shows the attendance that we have capacity of 9,000, but then we have portables on these campuses. It's kind of like, so we, we have excess capacity, but then we have portables in some areas, but it just shows that there's something that's not lined up correctly. Definitely having the right seats in the right places uh, is a nice opportunity and the right number of seats. Um, and I, you know, there was some comment about an understandable one about that school being important in the neighborhood, especially if it's been there for a hundred years and that students can walk to school, but it seems like most of the students or a significant percentage of them come from outside of the neighborhood. Um, so, uh, it, niche school in a really untenable facility, facility that, I mean, that's got to undermine the educational quality. It's got to undermine the working environment for the teachers. It's expensive to maintain. It will only get more expensive to maintain. So I just, I'm not, I just, I, I get that it's a beloved part of the community, but it seems like if the ultimate goal is a great educational environment for the students and for the teachers that can serve Waco for another hundred years, I guarantee you in 50 years, a hundred years, people are not going to be like, gosh, I'm glad we kept Alta Vista right here. Uh, you know, it just long range, which is what a master planning thing is supposed to do. It just doesn't make sense to, to keep that there forever. Um, there's lots of neighborhoods in Waco that don't have a school in walking distance. And that's why we spend a lot of money that the state reimburses for transportation to schools. And there's, you know, um, so uh, that's just kind of my sense of it. I believe the investment in the long-term vision, um, we're gonna get the better product. Not that the baseline option is not gonna produce something of quality, but it appears as though my perception is, yes, it's updating, but that's gonna take how long? And is it really fixing the problems or is it putting temporary band-aids? And as Mr. Zimmerman just stated, long-term, the quality that we're gonna have long-term and addressing those instructional, need, instructional needs and doing it the right way, um, where it's not just something for short-term, but the money is well invested in long-term. I was gonna say, I really appreciate the thoughtfulness with the long, uh, the goals. Um, I know a lot of thought has gone into those and I, I agree with those and I've spent quite a bit of time on all three of these campuses and especially see the need at Alta Vista and at Kendrick and um, you know South Waco I know it was new in the 90s but that's been a long time ago now and I'm just really curious I know how important these neighborhood schools are um, to the area and I know those decisions won't be made uh, lightly or hastily and really looking forward to seeing that attendance uh, map. I think that'll be very um, telling, especially for Alta Vista, as Kyle kind of alluded to. Yeah, and I think South Waco is actually older than that. Jared, do you remember what year South Waco was built? We have a little bit of conflicting data because one, I've seen both 1960 <laughs> and 1990. Yeah, this one was 90. And only reason I know Dr. Gincan is my sister-in-law taught there the first year it was open. So okay, it was a brand new school. Yes, ma'am. Ninety. Okay, it looks newer to me too. So I'm glad to know that. So there are many others we haven't heard from. We'd love to hear from everybody here. Uh, this is Johnnyet. I. I love to see us do the best we can for the students. And unless the older schools have really good bones, I would, uh, I would think it wouldn't be a great investment in those that really need to be replaced. And it's hard, it's hard for the community, but we're planning for the future. So I, I wanna do the very best we can for our, our students.
Okay, my thoughts are that um, you're gonna face a lot of resistance when you try to close out the VISTA, but um, be prepared and stand your ground because all of the, the reasons being presented are good reasons. And your communities suffer when, when schools are not there. However, I think University High School is such a premier uh, facility until I think that Alta Vista can, can still benefit from having, uh, from being in close proximity to, to university. So you, you do have some, you, you have some, um, some reasons to, um, to back people off when they, when they come after you for it because there will be some resistance to trying to close out to Vista. I think it'll be real important to be um, prepared with what we're gaining, you know, um, prepared immediately, you know, as, as soon as the conversations start with Alta Vista families to say, you know, you're getting a better, it, it, we, we need to frame it in, this is going to be a better um, learning environment. Um, someone mentioned the uh, foundation and I remember about seven years ago, um, one of the exterior walls from Alta Vista was starting to um, crumble off. Um, it, it really, it, it isn't too hard for parents to grasp um, as long as we really accentuate what they're getting out of it. I can also say that anytime, you know, you're going to deal with emotions, but um, the people make the school and not necessarily the building. And if the kids are going to get, you know, and one of the things you might, you might communicate is that, you know, the teachers that the kids love would have the options of, I mean, it's later on down the road, but the options of teaching those kids and continuing to teach those kids. Um, but I do remember that there was also a huge issue with the, where the extension was built, because I was principal there for a while, where the extension was built onto the original piece. And there were always issues around that area of the school. Um, so I think if we focus on the opportunity for the kids and the fact that the people make up the school more so than the building, I think that's the way to go. That's a really good thought um, of um, move kids around a lot in a fast growth school district to make boundaries and buildings work. And it it is about the people, kids are resilient, teachers move where kids are and it does, it does work itself out and sometimes it's better. <laughs> There are a few more that I'll see haven't chimed in. Uh, Andre, Angela, or Ms. Wilhelm Crater, anything y'all wanna add? I will. I actually taught at Alta Vista one year and uh, it was good. It was all about the kids and uh, Ms. Randalzo is right about the people. I, I think we have a lot of really, really good teachers. Um, I think when I went into the school, I, I felt the comfort but I was very disappointed um, just in one part. It's the gym at that point. It still had carpet. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like our kids deserve a gym. I think especially, um, I'm definitely a, a boy mom. I think they need to move, get up and just have the best. And um, I just, I, that is a big deal for me that we have a gym and a library that kids want to be active in. And I, and I know they've done some updates and all of that, but um, as a teacher, a third grade teacher, I want my kids up and moving and I want them reading. Um, so that that's big. I know it's gonna be hard. I definitely agree with Miss Francis. Um, those families, when I taught there, loved, 
loved Alta Vista, but you know what? They loved their kids being safe, their kids being educated, engaged, and um, definitely loved. And I, I, you know, I've been with Waco, this is my seventh year. And I think if we're cautious in combining kids and, you know, investing in what it's going to take to make our kids feel those that's safe and you're here and we want you here and you are part of Waco ISD. Um, I think it's a big deal. Um, like I said, I, I'm a big, I want my boys and, and girls to be active, but I want you reading too. So two big, big, huge things for me as a, um, an assistant principal now, and then as a teacher also. So. I think, I think for me, uh, growing up, you know, born and raised on the South Waco side, you know, my school no longer exists. I went to Saul Ross. And so, you know, that's, that school was knocked down. And uh, so, you know, I, I can see wanting to hold on to the old, but also I think, you know, how it says without vision to people perish. So it's like, as long as we're casting vision and we're casting, hey, this is what it's going to be you know, that's where the hope comes from. And if it's about foundation and if it's about our kids and it's about our communities, I think as long as we keep casting that vision and building up and giving them hope and, and uh, knowing that, hey, dreams are gonna come true in these facilities and because that's what it takes is the facility to be able to dream, to hold those dreams and be able to push them forward. And so, you know, like I said, saw, you know, I was a superstar, saw raw superstars, you know, hey, that's, that's, <laughs> that's back in the day. But, you know, I can see how people want to hold on to things. And, and sometimes you do, but there also comes a time where we have to let go for the new. And, you know, I'm excited. I was just wondering how I know you say a lot of some of the kids are crossing over on 35 to go to Alta Vista, how those boundaries will play an effect for who goes where or if that's going to be, uh, you know, I don't know how that's going to be implemented. But, yeah, as long as you cast vision and you bring people hope and, you know, support on both sides hearing at the same time, but being seen, being heard, but just having that vision in place of, hey, this is where we're going and we're here for you and we're gonna help, help you get there. I think that's what our kids need right now is more than anything is the encouragement uh, to know that, hey, what is in you, it takes a facility like this to help bring that out of you. And so, you know, I, I'm excited. Very powerful. Maybe we could call the new school Kendrick Vista or Alta Kendrick. <laughs> Oh, or I don't know. My wife just corrected me. I got that wrong. Um, but I do have a um, put superstar in it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, my question um, is: Is there a sense already? Do we know among the families and the parents? I'm sure the educators and staff who work there are quite aware of the limit limit limitations of the facility. But I mean, are the parents going to be shocked to hear that this building is really struggling and really? He makes teaching and learning difficult and maintenance is expensive. Is that a surprise or, you know, do people love the carpeted gym or whatever the, the, the version of that is currently? What do you think, Dr. McDurham? The building is, is old, but it's well-maintained. And the district has continuously invested in it. Um, so I do think that initially there will be um, some shock, but I, I don't think that it's a challenge that we can't overcome. I think we, um, again, we just, we need to focus on the, uh, <laughs> the fact that 15 years from now, out of it, if, if we don't do something, about the change, you know, Alta Vista would be really behind. And so we, you know, we just need to push what they're getting out of it. I will tell you when I, uh, my first walk through of Alta Vista on the back wing there, I could literally pull open a whole classroom where they had, there was a wall. I think there were some old sliding glass doors back there that were they put some plexiglass effect on the back. Um, I just thought you know, it wasn't very secure. I could have very easily peeled that right off that building with my hand. I'm not very strong. Um, and so we, 
you know, there were just things like that that were just real obvious walking through it the first time. Um, and so, yes, it looks nice and clean on the inside, but it really does have some major problems. Um, and I think that was, you know, evidenced by the, the damage with the storm um, and the flooding that occurred in that back um, classroom wing. Well, and they absolutely know that their brand new library was flooded and they had just mm -hmm. invested. I mean, that's a good example of our issues. They had invested heavily into the library and it was flooded um, because of the building. Yeah, I think Andre made such a good point. Andre, good to meet you. Uh, just the, um, you know, the, the vision and showing people, I mean, whether it's testimonials from current teachers and students, what frustrates you about this space and helping people see Yes, the floors may be clean and the place may be maintained. And then look, we're not quote unquote closing your school as much as providing a facility that for your for your grandchildren, your great grandchildren is gonna be kind of the pride of, of this city and of your community. Well, appreciate everybody's feedback. We got five seconds before we get back to the uh, main room. So if you have anything more, share. Back in the next meeting, to really vote and decide and direct. And here it's just get really gathering feedback so we can get you guys more information or perhaps uh, get you uh, find out more details. I think for me, it makes sense that um, the sensible part is, is that Alta Vista would be the campus that would be split because I do feel like Kendrick and South Waco are in two different areas. And so Alta Vista, I feel, is closer to Kendrick. So, I mean, and because it's smaller, but of course, that's the sensible part. But then you start thinking about the community that it does serve. So I can see why so many would be against that, you know, because they have an established community there and and there's a school community that's been built there and in, in the campus. So I can understand why many would be apprehensive about that. But um, I think Kendrick's at a good location where it's at in the community that it serves. And like I said, South Waco too, they're, they're not close. You know, um, I think that's a, I think those are great ideas for them to get two new schools. I, I, again, <laughs> having grown up in the Alta Vista neighborhood, uh, getting rid of Alta Vista and repurposing it for anything other than a school for students in that community would be a loss for that community. It would not serve the students whatsoever. It, it's, it would, I would only think that maybe it's serving someone else because the purpose, we all know that students learn in, in smaller environments where the teacher has more one-on-one -on -one time with the students and making larger classes are not the, the, the way to go, it's, it's the opposite. And so you, when you're saying, let's close down Alta Vista and let's take, make all the kids that walk to Alta Vista now take the bus to these other schools, now, now you're, you're interrupting their normal transportation for the parents and now they're having to fight for time with the teacher in these bigger classes new schools but much bigger classes and now they're at a disadvantage the numbers might show one thing but if you sit down with the students they're not they're being um the quality of education is being taken away and i, I personally my sisters went to alta vista in the 90s late 90s early 2000s and that was before it became a magnet school and it was thriving. It, it was an amazing community. It, it was wonderful with teachers there. We had so many uh, teachers coming straight from Baylor there. I, I mean, it was a wonderful campus being one of the older campuses. So I personally feel that the three schools are needed. Now, if we can't um, uh, financially restore them all, maybe finding another way of doing it um, in a way that we could still keep all three schools. Because again, I, it, I don't think the problem of having more principals would be an issue. 
I think having um, less um, less time with, for the students to truly understand what they're being taught. Is so I, I do want to I do want to uh, follow up on that. Um, when you say larger class size, do you mean like me as a student in a class of twenty versus me in a, a first grader that has five other sections of first grade? Five other sections of uh, like you're talking about larger class size. It's not yeah. larger class sizes. It, it's if you've got 20 kids in your class now, I'm making up a number, you're going right. to have 20 kids in the future. It's not putting 28 kids in a 20 student classroom. But They're they will not. have actual larger square footage. They will be in an actual larger room, but okay. the same number of students. That's correct. So the square, the you're, you're right. The square footage per student gets larger to address modern teaching. But if your class size TEA maximizes 22 students in an elementary school, not fifth grade. And so if your class size is 22 students right now, it's not going to get bigger than that going to a new school. I, so I, if the so population sorry, grows. I, I was probably thrown off just because they said they would have to hire more principals and, and teachers in order to have, keep Alta Vista. Well, if that's the case, they're going to be hiring more teachers or keep the same amount of teachers to to have those same size classrooms, is that so right? I wanna to touch a little bit about what Ms. Abito is saying. And um, I'm the principal at Kendrick Elementary. And back when we, when we consolidated, they redrew the lines to where most of the kids that could possibly be walking to Kendrick are being bused to Alta Vista or taken by car to Alta Vista. I get a lot of um, transfer requests from parents that live in the Kendrick neighborhood, but because of zoning have to go to Alta Vista. So I didn't know if you were aware of that. Is it really because of zoning, Isabel, was, or is it because of capacity constraints? No, it was, it was when it was zoned. I don't know if you're familiar with South Waco, but at Richter, all the way down oh. to our HEB, which is Irving Lee, all those back in the day used to come to Kendrick. But right. No, whenever, not. whenever we reconsolidated, remember we got the ones from Meadowbrook. So then that pushed those kids over to Alta Vista. Right. And, and that's what I was going to ask about. Yeah. Again, Meadowbrook. I think we're getting back to a capacity constraints. It, I mean, I, I it's pretty much full. Is that correct? Oh, we're full. But I'm just saying, if we were well, to so consolidate the schools, it it, it it's not that we're. Uh, not addressing the needs of the kids that live in the Alta Vista. I think if we look at the zone, they're really more closer to Kendrick just from the map. I'm just, just because I get a lot of requests for parents that live, like they say, I live down the street, can't you right. approve mine? But because we're at capacity, I can't approve them. I, I got, it. okay, I, I understand what you're saying now. Okay, thank you. Yes. But with a, larger, with a larger school, you could accommodate those requests. Yes, that's or, correct. Or like we said, we'd probably be redrawing the, the zones, obviously. Yes, more forward. than likely. That's uh, correct. Okay. And to tell you a little bit of our campus, we don't have any AC, HVAC in the hallways. When it's cold, our kids have to wear their jackets. Staff has to wear their jackets. When it's hot, we're just, it's sweat. I mean, we're all sweating. It's, it's, it's 100 degrees outside, it's 101 in the hallways. Um, it's a pretty old campus. We have one restroom with two stalls for, for our ladies to use and also for our men, but our majority of our staff are women. So could you imagine 60 women sharing a two stall restroom? Their teachers are having to use the children's restroom. So it's, our facilities are very, very old. I think that's why you made the list. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> or at least in part. I just had a few comments. I'm sorry. Um, I know that we had rezoned whenever we added um, Meadowbrook to the Kendrick area. Um, and then, um, but as far as Alta Vista, I agree with uh, Ilda that um, I would think that it would be best to keep it. Um, I am kind of biased though, because I went there, my kids go there, my son graduated, you know, went there as well. Um, but we're like in the middle, we go to Kendrick, we're having to go through I-35 or that, you know, service road. If we go to South Waco, we're having to cross 77. 
Um, Alta Vista, there are kids that walk there every single day. I mean, there's tons of kids that walk because it is in a residential area. Um, I just feel like I, you know, as far as classroom size, I know we didn't, um, you know, y'all said that it would be the same, like one teacher per, like the ratio is still going to be the same, but what's not going to be the same is a kindergartner walking in and instead of three rooms of kindergarten, there's going to be six or eight rooms of kindergarten. As far as the intimidation of the size of a massive school, that's what concerns me more than um, this. Yeah, anything else that concerns me as far as the size of a massive school. So I just kind of wanted to put my little two cents out there. <laughs> no, that's that's helpful. Yeah, I'm taking notes, by the way, everybody. <laughs> just just so I can remember because we can follow up on some of these things as we are all of these things when we move forward. Thank you, Casey. I know it's a lot. Ms. No, Malone, it's helpful. How many students are in Kendrick right now? Currently, we fluctuate. We've been getting a lot in and out, but as of last week, the last, I would say Thursday was about 498 kids, but um, like you saw, we can get up to 519. We've gone down to 489. There's a lot of movement this year because yeah, of COVID. A lot of families have been moving. What about South Waco? Do you, do you, I don't, I'm not... Do you happen to know what the South Waco numbers are? I can't remember what it was on that chart. No, I don't. I don't have that. As, as of today, South Waco is sitting at 488 students. Today, Kendrick had 496 and Alta Vista had 482. And, and if we- So if South we Waco, with, South Waco, Kyle just quoted 462 or 460. They actually have capacity at South Waco for um, 820. Wow. Oh, wow. So they're only half full? Yeah. Whoa. And so, so what do you think about the phase one as somebody working in the school? Did, were you excited about the option presented? Did you feel like it addressed the issues? I, I'm excited. I live in the Waco area and I've, my children grew up in the South Waco area. Actually, my daughter was able to um, go to Bell's Hills to the New York campus. And I was so excited to see it. it's just beautiful. It beautifies the neighborhood. I live in still currently in the Bell's Hills area and it's just beautiful. And I taught at university. I came from AJ Moore and I was just amazed at the facilities, how many more, how much more options our kids have whenever you consolidate schools. I know we hear the word consolidation and we automatically think it's bad, but not necessarily because it brings so many more choices to our kids, to our community. I'm amazed. I love going, um, well, of course we didn't do it this last year because of COVID, but whenever we go um, to other campuses, for example, Bells Hills are beautiful library. I mean, their cafeteria is just beautiful. Our facilities, we can't fit. Our, we have, our parents really do participate um, in our parent involvement nights. We were to the point where we would have to go to the University High School Auditorium for our Christmas events because we have such great turnout and we just don't have the facilities. I'd like to call attention to Felicia's comment in the chat. Um, because she has lived experience of going from a smaller school to a larger school. And, and I think a lot of it, it's the unknown is so frightening, but planning ahead, there are a lot of things that can be done to help students feel comfortable by the time they get there, they know the school. So I, I think that the, the, that is a comment worth paying attention to. Thanks, Felicia. On the, on the design end, uh, we did not put floor plans in front of everybody today. We can do so in the future, but there's um, big strides in space planning to break it down. And so if I'm a kindergarten student, I'm pretty much in one wing of the school and I stay in that wing with the kindergarten, pre-K, maybe first graders most of my day. And then I only come out for the specials or the the cafeteria, so it breaks them down into smaller neighborhoods, but yes. that's getting ahead of uh, things. That uh, would definitely heard, help. Yeah, having heard, listening to that, that approach would be way different than what I've seen in the past. That's mm -hmm. where my reaction came from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like living in a big city. You don't have to know the entire city of Chicago. You just need to know your neighborhood, your grocery store, your school, your 
faith community. You don't have to know the whole city. It, it can be manageable. And, and that's, I have seen that happen before when schools were consolidated and um, kids can feel very comfortable by the time they even get there in the first day when they know that this is all I have to know is this little part right here. So you're right, Hilda, it's, it's scary at first. And I think that's the value of, of this task force is we can work through those anxieties that parents will feel, come up with good solid responses. So when we present whatever the plan ultimately is, we can help alleviate those anxieties because we've already thought through them. And right. You guys are parents and you know how parents are going to think. And these are the responses. And I just think that's um, really helpful to have these kinds of conversations now so we can hear the, the language and the concerns before we get take this kind of thing public. Yeah. And I think that this is Deidre. And I think that the messaging um, and how it's communicated out to ensure that people really understand what the resources are and that it will be resourced well. Um, big, shiny, and new, but under-resourced is, isn't helpful. So I think it, I mean, there, there has to be a good combination of all those things. And so when you say under-resourced, do you mean like special ed support, art curriculum, music, those types of resources? Yes. Or and yes. so in, in, in conditions. And so, um, you know, Ms. Isabel just, just talked about the conditions at Kendrick. And obviously if it's, if it's new, some of those things will be alleviated, but there has to be um, a longer term plan past the brand new shiny thing on maintenance so that those, it stays that way. Cause you don't want it to be nice and well at opening and then you know, four or five years down the road, we're back at square one. Mm -hmm. All right. So we've only got about three minutes, four minutes left. If anyone else wants to toss out really any other thoughts, concerns? I just want to, I mean, I think the best opportunity for an equal, equal opportunity for all the students would be, I, I don't like consolidating, but I understand Alta Vista has a strong neighborhood. But for every student in South Waco area to have a equal opportunity across the board, it would be great to have better schools that can serve our students. And I mean, I don't like, I mean, I understand where Alta Vista is at and I work around there and I do see all the kids walking home at 3.15, 3.30 because I'm around that area every day. Casey, those maps that you guys showed earlier where all the different students actually are from, Yep. I, I think it might be helpful for us to see that for these three schools. Yeah. Uh, because I think Jose's right. I like what Ilda said. Misty has a, a clearly a strong parent perspective. I think it might be helpful for us to see what that would look like, what it is now, and what the new lines, how the new lines would move those students. Yeah, we can have Templeton pull those together similar for comparison to see just like we learned that a lot of the um, Cedar Ridge or Cedar View students were opting to go to Tennyson because it was physically closer. And what we heard from uh, Ms. Lozano is that she's seeing a lot of that at Kendrick or yeah. the desire to see that at Kendrick, but the in inability to accommodate. That would be really helpful, I think. Yep. Please, thank you. And also how we could go about uh, making those changes so that those who lived around, what did you say? Um, Isabel, it was um, the zoning. Yes, is that, the zoning, is that a city right. issue? Well, it was just back when it was consolidated in 2012, they redrew, the district redrew the lines. And so, like I was saying, the kids from like that live on Richter all the way to Irving Lee, which is behind HEB, you would think that they go to Kendrick, but they don't, they go to Alta Vista. There are students that live almost to Beverly Hills. They live right up against Memorial that go to Alta Vista too because of zoning. So there's quite a few. I'm happy to see Kendrick on the list because you can drive by Kendrick at 3.15 in the afternoon and it's insane. Like it's so congested and there's so much property there um, that it should have been expanded when Meadowbrook closed, but that just didn't happen. So I'm really happy to see it on the list. Absolutely. 
Great. Well, this is this is very helpful and kind of like we just did for the middle schools. We talked about it last week. We followed up this week. We're going to do that with the elementary schools. We're going to come back with more detailed information that addresses specific concerns we're hearing about um, before we sort of move forward on anything. Uh, this is very helpful. And of course, if you think of anything else um, after this meeting, feel free to reach out to anybody in the group um, leadership. It'll get passed along to us eventually. And I think we have about 20 seconds before we get zoomed back out. I just want to say thank you to the folks who brought up concerns. I think that's yeah. one of the biggest um, reasons that this group is, is important is to hear those kinds of concerns now. So Ilda, thank you for bringing that up so we can work through that and know the best way to respond. It's really helpful. Appreciate everybody. I know in our group, uh, we had really great discussion and, you know, talked about the, the opportunities and challenges that this discussion brings. And, uh, you know, I did one of the more powerful statements I heard is without vision, people perish. And, you know, ultimately vision creates hopes and dreams. Uh, and I think that's what we're hoping to do, but, you know, find that balance of community and everything else. So uh, as we finish out tonight, I uh, really appreciate everybody's patience here as we jump into this difficult subject. Uh, and so uh, as we talk about wrap ups and next steps, our goal really was here tonight to focus on that long term vision uh, and making sure that we're setting the right framework uh, for making decisions. Uh, look at the data uh, and as well get feedback on what those goals are and then how do we continue moving forward. Uh, so we will bring back uh, some additional detail and content as we move forward here in meeting number seven. Uh, so that meeting is on May 3rd. Uh, and again, we'll hear the demographers update uh, and then get into some submarine project and elementary school follow up, uh, followed by our last meeting, kind of wrapping it up here as we move forward. Uh, so appreciate everybody staying on time and uh, feedback and really appreciate the, the focus tonight, difficult subjects to talk about, and we thank you for your time. Uh, I saw uh, President Takel is with us, so I don't know if she has any last uh, words or Alan would like to jump in. Well, I'm just so happy I made it. I, I had a work commitment and then I was driving in my car with my, oh, I shouldn't say what I was doing. Anyway, I've been watching the whole meeting. And it's been really great. And my breakout room was great. And as usual, great feedback. Um, we appreciate you all so much. And we appreciate your honest and uh, candid uh, feedback and good questions. And we're just looking forward to continuing the conversation. May the 3rd. Anything else, Dr. King Cannon? No, peace, kindness, and love. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I love great that. way to end. That's our students' artwork. So. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Sykes, for filling in for me. All right. I, I don't know if you need to officially adjourn the meeting, but no, appreciate it. Officially. Thank, Thank you all, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone.